dia, Brazil. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about my department, the institutional home that I've had for so many years that has allowed me to do practically anything I want. And it's the department which um, Brian was attracted to, come over to about, uh, about seven or eight years ago. And you found it adequate, enjoyable. Only four years ago. Only four years ago. It seems like forever. More than that. <laughs> Uh, the English Department of Glendon College, York University. Um, I'm very interested in hearing how our department's concept of culture relates to the questions of um, this workshop and how it compares to English departments elsewhere. Both uh, countries, after all, are engaged in responding to change. And I think you'll see in my presentation that there are elements of our department that are um, leading the response to change and others that are somewhat more traditional. And this, in a way, reflects reality on the street and in the environment in which we work. Also, I think English departments have been studied in globalization studies. Um, in fact, our department had the benefit of having a visitor from Manitoba not so very long ago, I believe 2007 or 8, when uh, Diana Bryden was on a team of external assessors to look at uh, the English departments of um, York University. There were three, there were three, now there are two, Glendons and, and Keel, Keel Street. And I actually had the chance to look over uh, the team's report on our department uh, seven years ago. Our program has um, five threads, five elements, five emphases. And in the emphases that we have, I think we're quite unique. Certainly we're unique in York University, and I think we're unique in any English department that I know of anywhere. Because we, under our umbrella, we have literature, we have drama, we have English as a second language, we have linguistics, and we have the certificate program in the discipline of teaching English as an international language. And especially the international dimension of our department is something that has been part of the department forever. We were founded by very progressive Brits back in the 1960s, people who were in the Haldean, Malinovskian uh, tradition, Firthian linguistics. Uh, we never climbed on the Chomskyan train. We never were particularly interested in syntax. We were always interested in language and society, language and culture, language and reality. And we never distinguished between uh, native speaker English and non-native speaker English in the linguistics and English as a second language and, um, and uh, English as an international language program. However, in literature, I think it's going to be interesting to see that there are still traces, maybe more than just traces, of a traditional department that looks at English in a traditional way. But, this presentation I'm going to make relates to the question of agency and the question of literacy. Because uh, I had a conversation over the, uh, the break just now in which I'm fascinated by how um, our department of English would compare it to a department of Portuguese here in Brazil. And whether the kinds of approaches to literature in a Portuguese department especially a Portuguese department that was interested in varieties of Portuguese, uh, literary tradition of Portuguese, Portuguese in contact with other languages and so forth. Um, all of this would be a fascinating comparison, probably more, I think, Lynn Mario would agree, than a comparison really with English departments in, uh, in Brazil. As you can see, um, our department has a bilingual name. It is actually English, or Etude Anglaise. We never went down the street calling ourselves um, cultural studies or English studies, because English. But it shows that we are 
um, reflective of a bilingual uh, faculty in which all the students have to learn French and have to learn French at, a, at an ability, I guess, just below or just at an ability to take courses through the medium of French. Uh, we also teach Ojibwe, but that's another matter. An indigenous language. So, I'm going to report on um, my conversations with my faculty members who teach uh, literature. Uh, many of them told me, well, if I were going to Brazil, I would say this. And so I'm going to report on what they would say to you and give my interpretation. First of all, I have to describe our program. Studying English at Glendon is different from studying English at many other Canadian universities because all aspects of English are taught and considered worthy of examination. As I said, we encompass those five areas. Central is the examination of literary texts that the English-speaking world has considered important enough to pass on to future generations. Some of these texts require students to become familiar with the earlier forms of English. Old English, Chaucer's English, Shakespeare's English, for example. And more contemporary language studies require students to understand such non-print media as radio, film, and video. So we have this intersection between literary text and non-literary text. And certainly one of the conversations we have is, is there really a difference? In Russian, we always, I actually graduated in Russian, there was always the formalist question, what is literature? And what is literariness? Um, it's been a while since I practiced my Russian dialect of English. Um, also, the presence of many students learning to use English as a second language, and I think it's probably fair to say that uh, over half of our students do not have English as a quote-unquote mother tongue, or even a dominant language. So bilingualism in Toronto is certainly not just English-French bilingualism, I'd say that's elite bilingualism. Unfortunately, we know very few Quebecois uh, willing to pay the higher um, tuitions in Ontario than the very accessible tuitions in, um, in Quebec. But we were founded on the basis of having a dialogue between English Canada and French Canada, between English and Quebec. That's our mission in life. Um, the program matrix requires students to, um, if they are if they are majoring in in uh, in uh, English, to take. Just a moment. I have it in the other. Let's see if I have it. In take. Um, some foundation courses, one called The Structure of English, which is an introduction to linguistics, and an introduction to literary text, genres, and approaches. Everyone has to take that. Then they take uh, a certain number of linguistics courses, a certain number of courses before um, uh, 1650, anyway, before the Restoration, then after the Restoration, up to the 19th century, then 19th century to the present, and then contemporary. They're also required to take a certain number of uh, courses in Canadian English, Canadian English literature, and um, to touch with drama as well as, um, as non-dramatic prose. Uh, the culture of these courses, for example, the course called Literary Tradition of English, um, would be a more traditional course. It looks at um, British production of literary text throughout the course um, and uh, is an outline of the historical and cultural background along with a brief overview of language history. Um, but listen to this, our course in Poetry and Poetics begins with the dawn of speech in Africa to the rise of literacy in Mesopotamia, looks at Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, the Odyssey, Beowulf, all in modern English translation, and um, brings uh, the study of poetry and poetics up to the present day. 
We all we have a course which is relatively new. This is a new direction. Uh, Post-colonial liter literatures and theory. And here uh, we have really two courses. One is the key authors, theorists, and concepts in post-colonial studies that pertain to the former regions of the British Empire, including Canada. Um, so literature, uh, fiction, poetry, and drama from Africa, Canada, the Caribbean, Ireland, South Asia, and the South Pacific. The course aims to introduce students to literary study in a global rather than a national context and to enable them to enable to develop critical skills and a vocabulary to interpret texts that relate to the history of British imperialism and Canada's place in the British Empire. Again, a very critical standpoint. That's parallel to a course called Varieties of English, which looks at um, all manner of social and historical patterning, uh, patterning um, in English, including uh, multiplicity of uh, varieties of English across the world and social varieties within Canada. Also, historical dialects. So historical dialects, uh, social dialects, and geographical dialects. Um, the Canadian, the most interesting Canadian course uh, from a cultural point of view, I think would be the course taught by our colleague Cindy Zimmerman, um, who teaches a course called Writing from the Margins. And this is a course on drama and film, and I'll give you a sense of what it uh, refers to. Her reading list, for example, this coming year, includes a play about Korean um, corner stores and intergenerational conflict within a Korean family, Kim's Convenience by Yu Choi. A play and a film about five Asian Canadian young men who call themselves Bananas, and the name of the film is Banana Boys. They are yellow on the outside, white on the inside, wrestling with identity, race, and the death of a friend. They're not quite Chinese, maybe not quite Canadian, or maybe very Chinese and very Canadian. All of that resonates with the immigrant students, I think, in our classes. We have two uh, indigenous writers, the famous Thompson Highway, uh, Rez Sisters is taught, and Dry Lips uh, should go to campus casing, other go to campus casing. And therefore, what I'm trying to suggest in this is that we are bringing the margins into the center. We are trying to uh, include um, texts that are of importance to a variety of Canadian students. Um, the chairman of our department, though, I think is one of the more interesting uh, writers in uh, what we do. And I think I'm going to quote from his comment through me to you on why he does what he does. He is uh, a specialist in the historic construction of Englishness in the world through literature and the uses to which history has been twisted or made, particularly through Shakespeare or others, to create a sense of Englishness and later of Britishness. And the distinction between Englishness and Britishness is part of his course. He starts with the Renaissance, and the point of, the point of origin and the, um, the point at which he would start his talk to you if he were here would be to trace his roots back to new historicism or cultural materialism of the 1980s. He says their work shaped the work of literary scholars of his generation. And everyone working on literary texts sees texts as artifacts of a certain time, shaped by their historical, political, and cultural contexts. And how he teaches his authors, no matter whether they are in um, the Renaissance period or contemporary, he tries to show the uh, relationship between a text and its time. Five minutes. At its worst, he says, new historicism becomes rather humorless 
and takes everything as a historical document, attempting to decode political and other kinds of subversion in the most inane and innocuous works, imagining that the author in the text um, was just as was never just as capable of creating a text for the reason to have fun as much as to create a work for future analysis. However, the new, histori new, historic new historicist or cultural materialist uh, theoretical movement, he says, has done wonders for literary studies. It's opened up and shattered the canon, bringing forward hitherto unstudied female authors of the past and has attuned literary scholars to things beyond stylistics, a major flaw of the new critical school of the 1950s and 1960s that shaped the reception of the text and has provided many new approaches to narratives of first contact. For example, contact between uh, Europe and the New World. And has spoken incredibly productive offshoots, which would later become post-colonial theory. A historicized reader response theory roughly called the history of reading. And so he sees himself as developing a range of reader responses, which I hope we can get into, and looking at the history of the relationship between um, reading and writing. Um, so the idea I'd like to leave you with is this interdisciplinarity, which I described as having five strands, including, um, I guess we could say, linguistics applied to literature as well as uh, the teaching of English as an international language, but also the interdisciplinarity between literature and history <coughs> through the new historicism. And my colleague would conclude by saying, a student today in Canada can graduate from high school and enter university having taken only one history course in his or her life. Usually it's Canadian history, which is in effect taught in a vacuum as though, Canadian, as though Canada suddenly materialized in a blinding flash of light in the middle of the 19th century, only preceded by a very hazy dawn in whose gloom certain native figures roamed about aimlessly, apparently, according to the understanding of most students. How the natives got there, how Europeans got there, or why there was ever any issue between settlers and indigenous people is completely outside their frame of reference. And yet, the credible, the credible importance of the Seven Year War in the middle of the 18th century in global history and the formation of globalization during the struggle between the English and French in Canada, for them is a complete mystery. As it is, by the way, a mystery why on earth they are required to learn French. Where does that come from? No memory. As one of the students in uh, a history examination told a friend of mine who teaches history, um, said, it was so unfair, professor. You asked us about things on the examination that happened before we were even born. <laughs> <laughs> so my colleague says, given this state of affairs, what hope is there? for anyone attempting to teach such a student the cultural roots of the nation state of England or of Canada if it actually happened before they were born. So, thank you very much.